Hi, welcome back with Sister Beck. I will bless the Lord at all times, and His praise shall continually be in my mouth. I just thank the Lord today. It's a beautiful, sunshiny day, and God is so good. He's so merciful, and I love Him more today than I did on yesterday. I hope you've had a good week. I have these allergies still acting up and stuff, but God is still good. And I thank Him for helping me to walk, to breathe, and to even come back to you and we can talk about Him for just a little while. And with that being said, let us go to our Lord, our Savior, in prayer. Father God, we just thank you for this day, our lives, health, and strength. Thank you for your new mercies that you apply to us each morning. Forgive us, Lord, of anything that we said, thought, or done that was not pleasing in your sight. Lord, we want to please you. We want you to be satisfied with our praise and our worship. So help us this day to represent you and represent you well. Holy Spirit, fill us this day and give us your wisdom and your spiritual discernment. We pray for all the sick, the shut-in, the bereaved. We pray for those, Lord, who don't even have a home to go to. We pray for those, Lord, who don't have a mother or father. You say you'll be a mother for the motherless and a father for the fatherless. Lord, we lift them up to you. And Lord, we lift up every person that's on the face of this earth. Lord, we just thank you. We pray for the peace of Jerusalem and the nation of Israel. And we pray for all the countries and all the world leaders. Lord, we know that these are perilous times. But you said to look for those times. And we're in them now. But Lord, help us in your name, Jesus, to keep our eyes lifted to the hills, to you. Because you are our help. And Lord, we know that you will take care of your own. Lord, it's in your name, Jesus, that we pray and ask of these things, and we count it done. And Lord, as we go into this lesson, decrease me, and you increase, Lord. Let me say nothing that be added or taken away from your word, but let your word come forth, that it will touch some soul, Lord, to accept you as their Savior, that it will touch, Lord, someone who may be going through some things and who need to be strengthened in your word. That it would touch, Lord, someone who needs healing. That it would touch, Lord, someone who needs to be set free and delivered. And Lord, we ask all of these things in your blessed name, Lord, and we count them done. In your name, Jesus. Amen. I just thank God. You know, he's so good and so merciful and I was looking forward today to, to coming and talking to you a little while about our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ and we have a beautiful lesson today something that we celebrate most of us celebrate every first Sunday and some celebrate it every Sunday but he said as often if you do it it doesn't matter how often you do it. He said, when you do it, you're remembering what I did for you on Gabriel. And I never want to forget that. Because if it had not been for Gabriel, I wouldn't be here today. You wouldn't be here. He made a total sacrifice for us. So our lesson this week will be coming from Luke, the 22nd chapter. Verses 7 to 23. Luke, the 22nd chapter, 
verses 7 to 23. And it's entitled, real simple, The Lord's Supper. The Lord's Supper. And as we always do, we have a little background. <coughs> but before that, I just want to thank you for tuning in, listening to us. And continue to pray for us so that this ministry can go forth. Brother Lynn, we're still praying. Sister Marie, we love you, we're still praying. And we're praying for Sister May McManus, Sister uh, Ann McMiller, Elna Gibson, all of our sick members. We know that God is a healer, a healer, healer. We're also praying for the late Jamie Ellis family during this time of bereavement. God is a comforter, and we know that he is able to carry you through. All of our members, all the deacons and the deaconess of Rise and Ebenezer, all the trustees and their families of Rise and Ebenezer and the whole church family. And not only Rise and Ebenezer, but all the assemblies that's gathered in the name of Jesus. I wanna say also we're praying for Pastor Calvin Edwards and Sister Charlene Edwards of Pine Hall Baptist Missionary Church. God is still healing and God is still working miracles. So with all that being said, we're going to go to our lesson taken from Luke, the 22nd chapter. And it goes like this, the Lord's Supper. This was the last meal Jesus shared with his disciples prior to his death. The early Christian celebration known as the Lord's Supper received its name from the Paul's reference to the Supper of the Lord in 1 Corinthians 11, 20. Originally, it referred to Jesus' last meal with his disciples. Even if the synoptic gospels are correct in describing this last supper as a Passover meal, in John, Jesus' last meal is eaten before Passover. The meal should still be viewed in the context of the table, fellowship that was a distinctive feature of Jesus' ministry. In earliest Christianity, the Lord's Supper was pervaded by intense eschatological expectations, fervent hope for the new age to be inaugurated by the risen and exalted Jesus upon his return to earth. <coughs> it's obviously in Mark 14.25 and Luke 22.18 and it's echoed again in 1 Corinthians 11.28. In John's Gospel, Jesus does not institute the Lord's Supper during the last meal with his disciples, but the bread of life discourse in John 6, verses 25 to 59, likely reflects the understanding of the Lord's Supper in that community. Jesus speaks of eating his flesh and drinking his blood as the means of attaining eternal life. Verses 53 to 58. This emphasis in John's writing points to the incarnation to have eternal life. One must commit to Jesus as the revealer sent from God, the word that became flesh. John 1.14 Now, 
we're going into Luke. But John gives a little bit more in depth. It doesn't talk about the last event that Jesus did, but it explains why it took place and the symbolic uh, meaning of it, of that supper that we have to take all of Jesus, not a little bit, but all of him. So we will need to be striving each and every day to be more like him. How do you do that? By reading the word of God, by praying constantly, and by meditation. When we get in tune, he will show us things. He will do things. The more we take in of Jesus Christ, the more he'll show up in our life because we're here to represent him. According to most scholars, the feast of the Passover that Jesus and his disciples observed would fall on a Wednesday. Just two days, two days before Jesus' crucifixion. Passover was a Jewish festival that commemorated the time when God brought his people out of Egypt after the death angel passed over their homes and killed all of Egypt's firstborn children. Exodus 12. The Passover meal reminds us of what Jesus provided for his people on Calvary. God gave Israel three these instru instructions. It says, the Passover lamb was to be without blemish. Exodus 12, 5. The lamb sacrifice, verse 6, and the animal's blood put on their doorposts. Verse 7. God also told the people that if he saw the blood <laughs> on their homes, their lives would be spared. Today, when God sees the blood of the Lamb applied in our lives, we are spared from death and degradation as well. Caiaphas and the other religious leaders had already conspired to get Jesus. But they needed someone to help them. Judas was a willing nemesis allowing Satan to use him <coughs> in his ultimate plot. Perhaps Judas was a member of of the Zealots, the party that was determined to overturn Rome, Rome's control of Israel. If so, it was easy for the religious leaders to manipulate him for only 30 pieces of silk. Judith was not into turning the other cheek and loving one's neighbor as Jesus taught. Many scholars believe that Judas was very disappointed with Jesus and wanted to get rid of him as much as the religious leader did. Luke 22, 1 through 6. On the very next day, Jesus and his disciples sat down to have their last meal together before his inevitable moment at Calvary. <coughs> you know, when I read that, I thought Judas was there. He saw the miracles too. But he did not have Jesus to heart. He was just there for the game 
of this world. But he wasn't looking toward the world to come. He was looking for the now. And Jesus knew that. Jesus is God, y'all. He knows everything. He knew that. But I think about that. And it would have been better if he had never been born. For you to betray our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And we're going to get into the lesson. Starting with the first segment, Jesus, disciple, prepare for the Passover meal. And it's taken from Luke, again, the 22nd chapter, verses 7 through 13. 7 through 13. And it reads like this. Then came the day of the unleavened bread when the pass out pass over must be killed and he sent Peter and John saying go and prepare us the Passover that we may eat and they said unto him what wilt thou that we prepare and he said unto them behold when ye are entered into the city, there should be a man meet you, preparing, bearing a pitcher of water. Follow him into the house where he entereth in. And ye shall say unto the good man of the house, The master said unto thee, Where is the guest chamber where I shall eat? the Passover with my disciples. And he shall show you a large upper room, furnace, they make ready. And they went and found as he had said unto them, and they made ready for the Passover. Now you know, like I said, Jesus know all things. You know, last week we read when he was to ride into the city and he told the disciples again, go and tell them that I need this donkey, this coat, this baby donkey. And they asked, well, what, who should we say? And they said, he said to tell them that Jesus had need for it. He was going to return it. And they immediately let him have that donkey. They knew Jesus' reputation. But Jesus also knew that he was God. And he knew what was going to happen. Bit by bit by bit. And now, again today, he's telling them now, we're getting ready to have this meal. I need you to go and find a place. But he didn't really want them to know. He told them where to go. He just made sure that they reserved it. Because he already knew. And when they did that, he told them, now prepare for the Passover. Even when he knew he was getting ready to do a task, a great task. He had an order about doing things. And it says, Now the festival of unleavened bread arrived when the Passover lamb is sacrificed. Jesus sent his two faithful disciples, Peter and John, ahead and said, You all go and prepare the Passover meal. So we can all eat together. Where do you want us to pre prepare it? They asked him. He replied. As soon as you enter Jerusalem. A man with a pitcher of water. Will meet you. 
Ain't that something? Will meet you. He said to follow him to the house he enters. Say to the owner, the teacher, the master, Jesus, ask where is the guest chamber where I can eat the Passover meal with my disciples. He will take you upstairs to a large room that is already set up. That is where you should prepare our meal. And they went off to the city and found everything just as Jesus has said. And they prepared the Passover meal. Jesus knows. He knows. And now the Passover meal taken from Luke verses 14 to 20 and it reads like this and when the hour was come he sat down and the twelve apostles sat with him with him and he said unto them, What desire, what desire I have desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer? I want to eat with you this last time before I go through what I'm going to have to go through. For I say unto you, I will not eat any more. I will not eat any more until it be fulfilled in the kingdom of God. And he took the cup and gave thanks and said, Take this and divide it among yourselves. For I say unto you, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God shall come. And he took bread and gave thanks and break it and gave unto them, saying, This is my body, which is given for you. This do in remembrance of me. Likewise, also the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the New Testament in my blood which is shared shared for you. I tell you he was preparing or they didn't understand really what he was talking about. They really did not. But he was preparing them for what was to come. When the time came, Jesus and the apostles sat down together at the table. Jesus said, I have a very, I have been very eager to eat this Passover meal with you before my suffering began. For I tell you now that I won't eat this meal again until its meaning is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. Then he took a cup of wine and gave thanks to God for it. Then he said, take this and share it among yourselves. For I will not drink wine again until the kingdom of God has come. He took some bread and gave thanks to God for it. Then he broke it in pieces and gave it to the disciples saying this is my body which is given for you do this in remembrance of me you know I like to say when I read that <coughs> he 
said he won't eat or drink that type of meal until we're all at the table. Until everything has been fulfilled. Can you imagine that meal? Can you imagine that wine? And that wine won't make you drunk. And I can't wait till Jesus give me my portion of it. And he said, I won't do this until everything has been fulfilled. So he has a special place for you and me when we get there at that welcoming table where he's going to serve us and we'll all be together as the true family of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ eating conversing praising our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ for what he has done or had done for us on Catherine. Scripture doesn't indicate how long it took to prepare the Passover meal. But after Peter and John had completed their task, Jesus and the rest of the disciples arrived. Everything was set for the master and his followers to share a special time with one another. Jesus would use the meal not only to teach his disciples powerful truths, but also to share his most intimate feelings with them. As he sat with them at the table, feasting and sharing, Jesus called their attention to the moment at hand. First, he let the disciples know how much he desired to share the Passover with them before his death on the cross. The word desire refers to an intense longing that yearns to be fulfilled for three years. Jesus had poured his very life into these men. He loved them. The disciples were more than his students. Jesus considered them his friend, friends. Jesus also knew that after this particular night, he would not see them again. Jesus was going back to the Father. And the next time he and his disciples would share the Passover together would be in his Father's kingdom. Amen. Jesus' death was the means by which the new covenant would be established. Thus Jesus was pointing the disciples to the time when they would be reunited with him in the millennial kingdom. John calls this reunion the marriage supper of the Lamb. <coughs> Excuse me. And it's taken from Revelations 19 chapter the 9th verse. Where believers believers unite of all races and social standings will come together with the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit to celebrate, thank you Jesus, the victory that was secured for us through the cross and Jesus' resurrection. The disciples still did not quite understand the significance of this Passover. This, they, they knew he was doing it, but what is this representing? 
But Jesus had their attention. And he continued teaching, using the cup and the bread as a subject. Listen, that pointed to himself <coughs> as the Lamb of God. First, giving thanks to the Father. Jesus took the cup and passed it to his disciples. He wanted them to share the cup as a symbol that together they would be cleansed and redeemed by his blood. Jesus knew that once he was arrested and taken to Pilate, his physical life would come to an end. But the disciples were assured that just as they now drank together from the cup, so they would drink again in the Father's eternal kingdom. Jesus also broke the bread into pieces, passed it around to the disciples, and urged them to eat it and to drink from the cup after the meal. The bread and the cup represented Jesus' body that would be broken on the cross. And the blood he would shed, his death, was not only for his disciples, but for all you and me who would believe in him. <coughs> Excuse me. We have access. To the Father because of Jesus. We have access to the Father only because of Jesus. God the Father said, if you don't accept my son whom I gave to you for your dirty ways, you have no part of me. So Jesus is the glue. You can call on anybody else and say, oh, God hears me. If you don't accept our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, you're just running around with your mouth wagging, but it's not doing any good. You have to have Jesus. And as I say, just about every time, he is the glue. He's the one that connects you with the Father and the Holy Spirit. If Jesus is not there, then you have no communication with the Father, God the Father, and God the Holy Spirit. They won't even take any part with you until you accept Jesus first. His death whew, was not only for his disciples, but for all who would believe in him. We have access again to the Father because of Jesus. Scripture teaches that there is only one mediator between God and us. And that is our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. 1 Timothy, 2nd chapter, the 5th verse. While an animal sacrifice was necessary in the old dispensation, Jesus is the sacrifice God accepts. In the new, his body and blood, which were broken, and shed at the cross are the means by which all who believe in him shall be saved. Today, when believers partake of the communion elements, we are acknowledging that Jesus' death is sufficient for our salvation. That is why Jesus says, 
that when we eat the bread and drink the cup, we must do so in remembrance of him. And we're about to conclude. But I want to share this. Jesus is the one who saved us. And in the Old Testament, they killed the animals, the animals without blemish. And they sacrificed it. That was just a band-aid. Because they were animals. That was just a holding thing. Until the Messiah came. Our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. He emptied out himself. For us. His blood. Covered it all. That's why he said he was the New Testament. Because we no longer had to go and find an animal without blemish and slaughter it and sprinkle the blood and stuff like that. His blood covered it all on Calvary. It reaches. The highest mountain and it flows to the lowest of valley. The blood that Jesus shed from day to day, it will never lose its power. I don't care how sweet. How good you are. Your blood is tainted. You and I were born in sin, shaped in iniquity. And we had to go to God, Jesus, for ourselves to say, I'm dirty. Save me, Lord. I want to be part of you. And you know what he did? When we confessed and we repented, he put us right there. And I want to say this. If you truly accept Christ as your Lord and Savior, he will never lose you. He said it in his word. He said, Father, those that you gave me, I haven't lost any of them. That include us too. So don't think that you can jump in and out, in and out. Because that's why Jesus said, now I died for you. I've already shed all the blood for you. I bought you. I paid good for you. He paid good for us. No money could ever repay, but he paid good for us on Calvary. So once he have you right there, you are sealed to the day of redemption. I was talking to a person the other day and he says, well, you got to live right. You got to do this and you got to do that. Jesus paid it all. The thing about that, yes, we do. We want to please God. We have to be a living example. Because how are you going to tell someone you shouldn't do that and you're doing it? That's where the job of the Holy Spirit comes in. He's a keeper. And he will continue to clean you up. But just because I stumble today doesn't mean that I'm not in Christ. Because I'm sealed. And he knows our frame. And he's still covered on Calvary. 
And when you think that you're doing things so good and that you're saved because you're so good and you think you're so holy and so righteous, go back. You did nothing. You did nothing. Jesus paid it all. And he bought us. He paid good for us. We've been bought with a great price. His precious blood, blood that never been contaminated by sin. He paid good for us, y'all. And that's something to shout about. No amount of money in this world could buy your life. Could steal your life. He said, I came to forgive you of your sins, to bring you back to the Father, to unite you with the Holy Spirit so that you can be with all of us in glory. I paid for that so that you could be with me. I paid for when you had to lay down this life, this earth, this body that has really weighed us down. Some of us in more ways than one. He said, I came so that you may have life and that you may have life more abundantly. And I'm not talking about a bigger car. A bigger house. I was looking the other day at the television and it show where if you're getting uh, dark circles and bags and stuff, which we all will, well, me too, I'm getting them too, that you got this plastic surgeon who erased these things and make you have a more fervent and, and more lively life. You don't have to look the age that you are so you can get a more fulfillment out of life. There are a lot of people who have been so much into having a fuller life, but they still had to die. He said, I came that you may have life and have it more abundantly. I don't care what they erase, what they tuck in or take out. You're going to die. If Jesus doesn't come, you will die. That's your way out of here. But he said that's not the end. I came. The year when this life is over, there is another life. Now it's up to you to choose which one you want? Do you want the more abundant life of peace, love, joy? No more sorrow, no more sickness, no more pain, no more crying. With me? Or do you want the lake of fire where there will be gnashing of teeth, torment, crying, weeping, and wailing, and the worm eating at your flesh? And it would never be consumed. So do you want eternal hell or eternal heaven? Jesus said, I came so that you don't have to go to eternal hell. But you can be with me in heaven. And what a time, what a time, what a time. No, I haven't been there yet. But I have... And I believe what my Lord and Savior said. I believe his every word. And I'm looking forward. I'm looking forward to sitting at that table with him. Him serving. And him saying, now this is the new covenant. I'm going to eat with you. Now. 
and we would never part again. So I thank God for that. So if you think <clears throat> that you're good, that you're so sweet, and people, something tells me that, you know what I tell them? No, I'm not. The sweetness you see, the devotion you see, is the Christ in me. Because I'm a wretch undone. But I thank God. I thank you, Jesus, for saving my soul. I thank you, Jesus, that Calvary covered my ugly ways. I thank you, Lord, for putting me right there. And although sometimes I was bad, most of the time I was bad, but you still kept me right there. Had to get spanked a couple of times, but you kept me right there. Because I belong to Jesus. You belong to Jesus. And if you don't, you can do it today. And let's conclude this list. Thank you, Jesus. I get excited, y'all. I get excited when I know what he's done for me. And I know that I don't deserve it. I did nothing. But he wanted me to be a part. Our conclusion of this lesson is Jesus informs his disciples of betrayal at the Passover meal and is taken from verses 21 <coughs> excuse me to 23 and in this this is sad this is sad but it happened it happened. 21 says, But, behold, hey, there is still at the table now, still fellowshipping together. And Jesus knew he had to get ready to go. So he knew that it was time for Judas to do what he was going to do. Because we have to remember that Jesus knew each and every one of them. He knew what they were capable of doing. He knew if they was really for him or not. And he even says, a lot of times he said that, I've chosen 12 of you. He knew, and this was before, he said, I've chosen 12 of you, and one of you is a devil. So Jesus knew. 21 says, But behold, the hand of him that betrayeth me is with me on the table. And truly, the Son of Man goeth as it was determined. But woe unto that man by whom he is betrayed. And they, who, all of them, the disciples, they began to inquire among themselves which of them it was that should do this thing. Is it me, Lord? Am I? capable of doing that. God, the Son, knew. And we got to remember the Holy Spirit had not come. They were still babes in Christ. 
although Jesus had been with them over three years. They were growing, but they had not matured yet. Just like we do in life. We be babies, then toddlers, then children, then adolescents, then teenagers, and then adults. Then after adults, <coughs> excuse me, adults, middle age, and old age. There are stages. And they're still in a really much child stage. But they'll grow. But they, even in themselves, they was like, I could, am I, can I do that? When Jesus said, one of you at this table, whose hand is at this table, will betray me. Jesus knew which one it was. And I want to think that he did not say because they probably would have really killed Judas themselves because of what he was going to do. But Jesus kept it. To himself but he let Judas know if you read the whole thing go and do and do what you got to do quickly in other words go ahead and get it over with Judas I'm ready and he was so set in the mind after receiving the money because like I said he was Judas was a now man he wanted his he wanted his now. He was about the money, about the materialistic things. So Jesus kind of whispered to him, go do what you got to do. So he slipped out. And I thought about that thing. Lord, when someone hurt us, are we supposed to go and televise it? And we all have been hurt. And sometimes when we're hurt, we want everybody to know they hurt my feelings. They didn't do me right. But I'm learning, okay? Talk to Jesus about it. He can work it out. We don't want to be a busybody to start confusion. We have a lot to learn from our Savior. He could have said, y'all, Judas getting ready to turn me in. But he didn't. He said, do what you got to do. Now go ahead. I'm ready. And they didn't know that Judith was the one to do that. When you're hurt, when you've been done wrong, you don't have to broadcast it. Talk to the Lord about it. And He will reveal. He will fight your battle. He took that on Himself too when He was up there dying at Gary. Took everything that would hurt us or go against us. He took that for us. So let us be mindful. Pray for those. The Word of God say, pray for those who do things ugly to you. We have to continue to love them. And if you're having trouble doing that, Holy Spirit, I need an extra push in this area. Cause I'm not feeling the love right now. And I don't want to go around feeling like this because I want to represent Christ. I want Christ to use me. And he can't use a vessel that's got hate in it or that's dirty. Because he's holy. He's a holy God. <clears throat> and I conclude
look at you like this. Says the disciples were probably fascinated by Jesus' teaching as he made himself synonymous with the Passover lamb. They had been enjoying the story that he was telling them. It was shocking to hear Jesus' next word. He had, it was up on high and he was giving them the reason for the bread and the wine and I'm gonna eat this with y'all in the kingdom and all this stuff. But then he says, someone, and, the, and, and this was it. It was shocking to hear Jesus' next words. Someone at the fellowship meal would be instrumental in turning Jesus over to his enemies. But the disciples were shocked to know that there was an enemy in the camp. Because Judas evidently a hypocrite fit in. You know, like he was for everything too. And began to ask the Lord who it was that would turn on him. Obviously, if Jesus knew the man would be in the city with the pitcher of the water, listen to this, it wouldn't have been too difficult for him to point out his betrayal. He knew. Jesus' arrest and trial had already been foretold by the Father in the scriptures. But it would be tragic for Judas, the one who would raise his hand against Jesus. The Bible indicates that Judas eventually hung himself after he realized the extent to which Satan had deceived him. Matthew 27 verses 3 to 5. The Lord's Supper is a special time for the church. We must always remember that it <clears throat> commemorates a special occasion for believers every time we partake of the communion elements we need to remember just how much Jesus sacrificed so that we might enjoy sweet fellowship with him and the Father in eternity Amen Sweet fellowship <coughs> in eternity, forever. And I thank God. And I pray that you have gotten something out of this lesson. God is so good. And as I was reading, as always, my heart. Is filled because I know that he did all of that for us. Thank him each and every moment that you can because he's been so good all my life. He's been faithful all my life. He's been so, so good. I haven't been, but he has. And he hasn't given up on me, and he hasn't given up on you. If you don't know him, accept him as your Lord and Savior. Believe that he walked, taught, preached, teached, Save, heal, raise the dead, die, 
was buried, but got up with all power in his hand. Accept, believe, and confess. Lord Jesus, come into my heart. Guide my mind. I want to live my rest of my life into eternity for you. Forgive me of anything I've said, thought, or done in my life that was not of you. Cleanse me. Make me whole, Lord. Your blood covered it all. Cover me. If you say that, if you believe that, you are saved. And let nothing separate you from God. Get into a Bible, Jesus teaching church, and learn more about him. I tell you, you will be blessed. You'll learn so much until you just want more and more. If you're in a backslidden way, ask God to forgive whatever you ever did. Don't wallow in that because that's one of the tricks of the devil. You know you're not good enough. You know you did that. You know, you know he won't forgive you for that. Yes, he will. Yes, he will. He would have forgiven Judas. But the devil had his mind so tangled up till he Got him out there. You know he's not going to forget. You betrayed the Son of God. So he killed himself. Repent. And get back out there. Working. For the Lord. Those who are. Going through some things. Our God. Is able. To handle any problem. Yes. Satan has control of this earth. But guess what? Jesus is in charge. Satan might be the hall monitor. But God is in charge of the whole atmosphere. Satan can't do anything without him getting God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit's permission first. So whose side are you on? Serve the Lord. I pray that you have gotten something out of this lesson. I always do. And I too want to just give a shout out to Aunt Shirley, Aunt Ina, Aunt Muzz. Hello. And Charlotte. All of my family, I love you. My mother-in-law, Alberta Brown, who just celebrated her birthday the other day. God bless you. My brother and sister-in-laws, God knows you know. And just the whole family, my whole church family. And I'm not just talking about Rise and Ebenezer, but the whole church family, Universal Lee. We just pray for you. And... With that being said and done, I just want to give you a listen for the next time. We'll be coming out of Brother John, John, the 20th chapter, verses 1 through 10. And then we're going to verses 19 to 20. So it's St. John, the 20th chapter, 1 through 10. And then we're going to skip a couple of verses and go to verses 19 and 20. And this is called the living word. Amen. The living word. So we'll be right back in there. Talk about our Lord and Savior. The living word. And I pray that you have a good week. We pray for one another. And I tell you, y'all. These are perilous times, but we're able to sustain with the help of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, because Calvary covered it all. Pray for us. Pray for this ministry. Lord, we pray 
right now in your name, Jesus, that this word would go forth, that it would touch someone, that someone would be saved, delivered, and set free, and that it would reach the masses. And we just have faith in that. Give us a thumbs up, and please pray for us. And I thank you. I love you. And if it's God's will, I'll see you on the next time. Bye-bye.